Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If I were to close my eyes and say, how many people did I think answered me at say maybe three? So let's test it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for showing up. And um, I'm glad to be here, alhamdulillah. The topic I have been given is one I actually enjoy reading about, learning about. I sometimes joke that our kids are our experimental subjects. We are trying out stuff on them on parenting. But when I'm asked to speak on parenting itself, I first wonder what my audience would be made up of. And right here, I see people who would tell me many things about parenting. So I'm going to admit right off that when it comes to parenting our kids, I'm sure my husband and I don't know a lot of stuff. I'm sure there are many things we don't know what we are doing, but we are trying to do our best. Yet it's a great subject to talk about, inshallah. Earlier on, I heard someone ask if people could move forward. Can I ask again? Can everyone move forward? If there's an empty seat at the table in front of you, just fill up the seat. Usually people say women's rights have to be upheld. When we come to functions, I see women running backwards. There are about three free seats here and two free seats there and one free seat over there. Let's just move forward. Yes, so sorry to inconvenience you. But I think there's a greater feeling of togetherness and sisterhood when we come closer together as much as we can. Thank you very much for obliging me. So I'll go straight into this topic. There are some questions that um, we could call big parenting questions because these questions are the same that many parents ask themselves and they are powerful questions that guide us when we want to choose a particular action or make a certain decision regarding our children. First question, what kind of person do I hope my child will become? Before our children are born, for those of us who have kids, you know you have already dreamed them into life. And even those who are not married, they've already started dreaming of what their children will be like. How many of you already see your grandchildren even though you don't have kids yet? Admit it, you do, you know you do. And even if you just have babies, you already see their children, right? I wish I. The camera is on me, not on you, right? Yes. So you have dreams about what you hope your child will become, but what are you doing, what are we doing right now to make sure our children actually turn into that person we hope and dream they'll become? What kind of human being are we raising for the world? Sometimes when we talk with teachers at our school, we say, remember you are educating the children for the world, not for your classroom. Similarly, are you raising the children for your home or for the world? They will interact far more with the world than they will with you at a certain point in their lifetime. And at a point in time, if things go according to the natural order, the expected order of things, we will pass away from the world, our children will remain, and the world will have them. What kind of human being are we raising for the world? And when our children look at us, what do they see? What do they see? And when we look at our children, what do we see? And when your children have any interaction with you and they look into your eyes, what version of themselves do they see in your eyes? It's possible to interact with someone, to look closely at them, and you can see yourself in their eyes. I'm not talking about the reflection in their eyes physically, no. You can see what they feel about you, what they think about you. And children are just as smart as we are in that way. It's instinctive. It's Part of the fitra, we were born to be able to do that. So when your children look at you, what do they see? What kind of person are they looking at? And what kind of person do they see in your eyes? And then this one, 
If your child turns out to be very much like you, would you like the person they would be? Do we understand the question? You know yourself very well. You know your pluses, you know your minuses. If your child turns out to be 80% like you, would you like that child? Would you want to hang out with that child? Food for thought. Then, in raising our kids, are our methods consistent with their reality, or are we stuck in ours? Are our methods consistent with what they are dealing with right now, with their world as it is today, with whatever it is your child is facing based on his or her peculiar context? Or are you still stuck in your lifetime, your world, how it was when you were raised? Some of the old ways and the old things are very good, but are they effective for your child? And then do I know what I'm doing at all? Am I doing the right thing? As we go through the talk, hopefully we'll reflect on questions. The time is too short. If not, we would have been able to do a lot more interactive stuff, but the time is short. Today's world is the digital generation. We heard quite a bit about that this morning. And the devices and the internet come with their pluses and their minuses, and that's part of the reality of our children's world. The other day, I watched a friend's son. The boy is one year old. He hadn't even clocked one then. Sitting down, holding a phone, and he was swiping. And because we couldn't see the screen, we thought maybe he was just mimicking his mother's gestures. But later on, she turned it around, and he really was looking at photographs. He was so composed and swiping like this. And he's not even, he wasn't even one year old at the time. Can barely speak, can crawl and barely walk, but he's swiping. Wow. Usually I pick up a strange phone and I just go like this and I go like that and my friends laugh at me. I say, yeah, I'll keep trying. Something is bound to happen. <laughs> they are growing up in a world of instant gratification. Someone asks a question, you Google, you get answers instantly, hardly waiting for anything. Fast food, fast this, fast that. When I tell my children about my years growing up, how if you wanted to change the channel, you had to get up and walk over to the television. And at first, you had to hold, grip this dial and go <coughs> Then later it was buttons you press. <coughs> and I was trying to tell my son, and he was trying to figure it out, like, what do you mean? There was nothing like this. I said, no, nothing like this. And the channels were fewer anyway, thank God. Can you imagine trying to turn that dial and you have 250 something channels? <laughs> It also means the attention span is shortening. So sometimes when you think the kids can't hear you, they really can't hear you, they tuned out a long time ago. They closed your page a long time ago. They unfriended your talk a long time ago. Then there's a growing challenge to, atheism, to our faith, atheism. When we were growing up, it was, oh, don't switch to another religion. But right now, we have a movement, even back home, of people who are saying, Look, God doesn't exist. It's not about switching fates, but this is a growing challenge to us. There also is an awareness, an awareness of diets. What should children eat to be healthy? We have advancements in medicine, in treatments that ensure our children will be physically healthy. The great challenge is the spiritual and emotional health. And when I was asked to talk on raising healthy children. I thought I would focus on that. Spiritual and emotional health. Mother spiritual. It's a safer place for me, actually. I shouldn't be talking about medical health to people who probably know a lot more about that than I do. Strategies that I'll touch on as we go through the talk is the power of modeling. Don't just tell. Actually do what you want kids to do. Be who you want them to become. Model what you want to see. The power of consistency. Ensure that they form habits, those positive habits, weave them into the routines of your family life, the chores of your family life. If you want time to bond with children, find an activity that's already part of what you do every day anyway and introduce it, particularly if you're dealing with children who are at the age where they are trying to 
be more independent. Recently, when I was trying to bond with one of our kids because the other two traveled, I chose to do it over dishes. At night, they usually wash the dishes, so I chose, no matter how exhausted I was, I would go into the kitchen with him, would wash dishes together. And while we're doing that, we would either chat or I would, we would um, sing songs together. I love singing, I love poetry, I love words. So I would pick songs that are upbeat, the lyrics are positive, and we would sing them together. And sometimes, if I had a bit of strength, we would dance together. Crazy dancing and have a good laugh about it. It was a way to bond, but woven into something that already existed. The power of questions. I had considered calling this talk powerful parenting, but my husband said that might be misleading. But I said I'm talking about the powerful things we could do. So the power of questions. As human beings, we are wired to ask questions, to wonder, to think about things, to say what if, to say why, how, when, who. We start it as soon as we can speak and we drive our parents crazy and our children revenge on behalf of our parents and drive us crazy with their questions. But we don't ever stop asking. It's a natural thing. Even Angels Ask is the title of a book by Dr. Jeffrey Lang. And in that book, he talked about the fact that angels asked Allah, why would you create human beings? They are going to be on earth and cause trouble. You know, it would be like a child say, mommy, why did you have to allow that boy come and visit? He's just a troublemaker. They asked Allah that question. When Maryam was told she would have a child, she asked the angel, how is it possible? No man has touched me. Ibrahim alayhi salam asked Allah, how do you raise the dead? And when Allah said, don't you believe? He said, it's not that I don't believe, but just I want my heart to be at peace on this issue because I wonder about it. And we wonder about a lot of things. What is death like? What is life after death like? And if you say Allah was not created, so what was there before him? I remember asking this question when I was a teenager. I still clearly remember lying in bed one night, I couldn't sleep, and I was trying to picture infinity. The universe goes on forever. Allah wasn't created, he has always existed, but there must have been a time before him. I remember asking, but I didn't dare open my mouth to ask anyone such questions. But we must teach our children to be comfortable asking questions, even the tough ones. And we must be comfortable hearing the questions, even when we don't have the answers. Because to ask sometimes doesn't mean we are rebelling or rejecting. Sometimes it really means we are wondering about it. We are trying to wrap our minds around a concept or an idea. And it wasn't until recently that I began, wow, 10 minutes, okay. Are you sure that clock isn't too fast? It wasn't until recently that I began to articulate answers for myself to some of those questions because some students asked the same questions. And though I had come to, uh, to find peace in myself, I needed to articulate it for somebody else. The understanding that if there are things you haven't experienced, you can hardly understand them. And to be okay with that, not to be so arrogant in our minds that we must have all the answers for our kids. Honestly, sometimes look at a child. By child, I mean a teenager, a five-year-old, a 20-year-old, and say, you know, I wonder about that too. Honestly, say it to the child. So the child knows this isn't, this isn't shirk, this isn't a bad thing. Teach them by asking them questions. Let the questions they ask you tell you what they need to know at that point in time. Connect them with Allah. Use the Quran. I'm surprised at times when people want to connect to Allah and be spiritual and increase their faith, but there's distance between them and the Quran. And I don't mean physical distance, but a distance of the mind. Let them connect through understanding. When I was young, the connection I had with the Quran wasn't a good one. It wasn't positive. The introduction was poorly done. There was this teacher who was the teacher with the whip. And his method was to say, okay, here are these words. We use the book then known as Baghdadi Al-Qaeda. Here are these words. To me, they were just squiggles on a book. 
You say this, you say this, you say this. Ah, minan, ba, isan, ali, fun, ba, un. And you have to scream it out loud. So from where I'm t sitting as a teacher, I know you are reading. And it didn't make sense to me. I was about eight or nine at the time. Why should I scream out loud? Everybody is screaming. Why should I? And so I wouldn't scream out loud. And so he would take the whip to me. And when he beat me, I was a very strong-willed child. I would scowl, then stop reading, then get scolded and beaten again. And we repeat the same thing the next Saturday. So naturally, I grew up not wanting, not caring, not understanding this whole thing. It wasn't until I was in university that I was reintroduced to the Quran. English translation. No Arabic in that particular copy. And a friend said, just read it like a book. And that seemed like so wrong. She said, read it like a book. I said, read which part? She said, open any part and read it. And I started then, and that's what I do today. I open, I read, I seek to understand. Today we have young people who do not connect with the Quran. They can't connect with Allah because they don't understand his words. Even if they speak Arabic, to them the words don't speak to them. That isn't talking to me. So there's a subject that we teach, Quranic Arabic. Right now, I don't speak Arabic, but if I listen hard enough to recitation in Arabic and the person slows down a bit, I would be able to get the gist of the verses because I read often in English, read the Arabic, go back and read the translation and try and figure out where the words are informally, but now we teach it as a formal subject. And um, we've taught it for a term. And just, I think, about two weeks ago, I called some of the students and said, you've been doing Quranic Arabic now for a term. Have you learned anything new? They say, yes. Now we wonder what verses mean. When we hear something in Arabic, we start to wonder, what does that mean? And someone said, when someone is reciting, I can actually pick out sometimes just one word. Like, I know that word. It means this. So connect your children with the Quran. Let them read it to you in the language they understand. You can select what you think is appropriate for their age and interest. Something interesting was, I started telling the story of Yusuf to students in school, and I thought, why do it only in school? Go home, tell the story to the children at home. So I did. At a point, I debated, you know that question, am I doing the right thing? Do I even know what I'm doing? I thought, should I go with the copy of the Quran, I like Yusuf Ali translation, or should I just put the big fat book aside and just tell the story? And I thought, why separate the story from the source? This is how they make positive associations with the thick fat book with the squiggles in it. So I took the book to the room. Then it was just our youngest son who was living with us. So I don't confuse you, my husband has two children from a previous marriage, he got divorced. I have one, the youngest, from a previous marriage, I was widowed. So each time I say our youngest was living with us, you don't keep wondering, where did the other two go? They were with their mom at the time. So I took the big fat book, and I would read from it, and then break it down to him. I did it for a few nights. Then one night, as I was going to take my big fat book away, he said, Mama, leave it. I said, you'll read it. He said, yes, Mama. So I opened to Surah to Yusuf, opened to where we stopped, and I went away thinking, hmm, I wonder what will happen. By the following day, I said, where did you stop? He could actually say, well, I stopped where so-and-so happened. And I brought it back, and he read it again from the big fat book with a tiny print. At that time, he was only about eight years old. So sometimes when you think they are too young, you are the one who is looking at them as too young. Even the baby is not too young. Open the Quran. If the language you know your child will end up speaking is English or... Give me a language, please. Africans or whatever. You have the translation of the Quran with the Arabic on that same page as well. Open it with your little child. Just the way the boy who wasn't yet one year old learned how to swipe your little child will start to learn that this book has got good stories in it. Yusuf and his nasty brothers. Musa in the basket on the river. His mom put him in there and she was so afraid. He will learn to associate the Quran with learning, 
with love, with light, with understanding, and the freedom to ask questions. The power of stories. Allah teaches us with stories. It's either the story of someone who really lived, or it's a metaphor with a narrative style, or an allegorical story, allegorical story. It's, it didn't really happen, but he's saying, imagine if, what if. That is how Allah teaches us. And if we copy the same system, there's so much more we can share. In today's world, most people dress like Westerners, Americans, the British. Why? It wasn't just colonization, or maybe a kind of colonization, through stories, movies, and the television. We step into stories. And if we step into stories with our children, we can teach them perspective taking through stories. And that's an aspect of emotional intelligence that makes children emotionally healthy. Learn let them learn how to see the world through the eyes of another. And stories can do that. You can say, if you were Yusuf and your brothers had just pushed you down the well, what would you do? What would you do? And you can hear their answers, and sometimes their answers will tell you the kind of child you are raising, can tell you where your child is at, can tell you what your child is struggling with at that moment. The power of reading. The reason why I think my son could easily say, leave the great fat book for me at the age of eight was because he was introduced to books and reading right from when he was a baby. His late father and I bought loads of books. And at first, I, I thought he would have to be old enough to read them himself. But his late father had a different approach, read them to him. And don't just read them to him, put in sound effects. If the line says, the horse ran down the road, go, the horse ran down the road. And let your fingers go like the galloping legs of a horse across the page of the book. That was my son's introduction to books and reading. It was fun. And it was at bedtime. It was a time to be relaxed, weave it into something. Something my husband and I would, we have said we'll try and do, is have a time, either on weekends or at certain points in the day, where we all cluster in the sitting room and we all read a book of our choice. And we will share what we've read. We are going to try it. We are going to experiment with our kids, inshallah. And I got that from a great book. You might want to look it up. It's called Unselfie and selfie, teaching children about empathy. That's the title of the book, a yellow book. I love the book. Set reading goals or reading shifts. That's another thing we are going to try and do. Take a single book, give it to the children, and say, you read from this page to this page, and tomorrow night you are going to tell us all about what you've read. And the books we are targeting, some of the nice ones we saw in the bookstall over there, about some of the great scholars of Islam. Recently, I took a fat book, on Umar bin Abdulaziz and took it home just to see would anybody be interested. One of our sons was interested and took it as his bedtime reading book. So introduce them. Then there are audio books as well. Why do I mention audio books? Not all children will always love text. Some are hyperactive. They want something to listen to while they are playing with their toys. When my son was little, he would come to me and say, Mama, I'm bored. What do I do now? like I'm um, his entertainment channel. Mama, I'm bored. What do I do now? And I would look at this three-year-old bored. He can't even spell the word. But he would always come. Mama, what do I do now? Then I came across seven habits of happy children, patterned on seven habits of effective person, people. And the, they had the audio version. And I thought, problem solved. So I got the audio version. And at night after he has said his dua, I've said good night, I would slot in that CD and he would listen to it. And that was how we came to understand that when you are bored, you don't ask mama, what do I do now? You go and make your own fun. Saved me a lot of trouble. Then also, another thing we do is to say from time to time at night, they read a book on Islamic etiquette. Thank you. Etiquette and moral conduct. Each child takes turns to read, and they share what they understand from their reading. Now, we planned that because my husband said they need to know a bit about Islamic etiquettes and morals based on hadith, not just good old common sense, because the hadith have good common sense in them. But we then had 
a side effect that's actually a plus. It improved their reading, fluency and confidence. We just noticed over time they were reading faster, much more clearly and with greater confidence. We didn't plan that. We didn't even correct their reading, except maybe their pronunciation of a word was very, very wrong. That's only the, the only time we would correct it. But they learned by that, so it's a plus. The power of modeling. We want children who are generous, courageous, conscious of Allah, curious, who learn. We want children who are optimistic, they are persevering, they are ethical, they are humble. Are we those things? Are we any of those things? When we speak, do our children hear put downs in our voices? Do our children hear us putting ourselves down? But we want them to have self-esteem. Do our children hear us saying nasty things about people, but we want them to be respectful? Growing up, I grew up in a community where insults could fly very freely. It didn't take long for an insult to fly out of this person's mouth at that person. But understanding Islam, I began to say, no, I don't want that in my home, in my family, or for my kids might make them sound naive or like goody two-shoes, we don't say bad words, but yes, sometimes being goody two-shoes is the way to go. So we made a resolution, first with my late husband and currently we don't use insults in the home. Recently I heard my son say, one of our kids say, somebody said something nasty today, it's a bad word. I said, what is it? He said he called someone stupid. I said, yes, alhamdulillah. When we are struggling to brush the F word and the S word out of children's mouths. If a child says stupid is a bad word, may Allah preserve your innocence, your linguistic innocence. But I thought so well that one day I was driving, our youngest was in the back seat. A driver cut me off. I said, what's wrong with him? That's so stupid. He said, Mama, don't say that. From the back. Mama, don't say that. And I thought, oops. Model well and they will copy you. What does my child see when I'm staring at my phone at the same time that I'm, that I'm talking to somebody else? What does my child see? He thinks that's the way to communicate. You can communicate to someone and you're busy doing this. You're scrolling and you're talking at the same time. And sometimes I catch myself giving him instructions and I'm not even looking at him. I'm looking at my laptop. Have you done this? Have you? Hmm? He answers and I'm already into my laptop. I didn't hear the answer. I have to wait five seconds later to say, wait, I asked you a question. At a point I say, asking myself, what are you teaching him? What are you teaching him? When he stops paying attention to you, you will complain he's being disrespectful. But mama, what are you teaching this boy? Am I telling him it's okay to not have time to look at people's faces? One day I asked myself, if when he's a man, he's your age, and you, his aged mother, if Allah preserves your life till then, you are sitting down talking to him, and he say, mm, yeah, mm-hmm, what would you say? How would you feel? Teach him now how you want him to treat you. Sometimes it's important to teach children how to express themselves, how to say, I'm feeling very bad right now, or I'm sad or I feel slightly discouraged. But to also teach them how to bring yourself out of that place if you're in a bad place. But to teach them, here's how I feel, and here's what I would like you to do. Early on when I started working in the secondary school, I was a hostel staff, so I lived in the hostel. I had a room downstairs, children were upstairs. I already had a habit that I must have siesta at some point between 2 and 4 p.m. Anything later than that, I would wake up feeling as if I have malaria and a fever and a headache and, and the blues. So I needed that sleep. If I don't sleep at that time, then I don't function well. I'll be awake, but really more zombie-like. So I needed to sleep. But the students would come with their problems. They need help. They need some question answered. They need something sorted out. They need a squabble to be sorted out. So what did I do? I made a sign, a simple sign like that one that has been terrorizing my life. <laughs> and I, would write, I wrote on it, sleeping in progress. 
and I put it on my door. Whenever it was time to sleep, I'll get masking tape and tape it to my door. The first day I did it, I said, I'm sure I will wake up and that sign will be gone. Or a child will come and knock on the door just to annoy me. I went to sleep. I slept for an hour and a half. I woke up and the sign was still on the door. And they never ever tampered with that sign. Sometimes I would wake up and as I'm going into the bathroom to perform ablution, I would hear a child, by child I mean students, from around the ages of 11 to 17. I would hear one tell the other one, shh, she's sleeping. Shh, she's sleeping. And that's when I realized there's nothing wrong sometimes with telling children, I'm exhausted today. Right now, I can't deal with this. You'll be surprised, a child will support you. The other day, I was telling my husband that I had a really rough day and I just have no energy left. I said, I'm just exhausted. I have no energy left. I have no power, no drive. And I didn't know that one of our kids, his satellite was in orbit. That's what we call it when they are listening in on your conversation. <laughs> so he picked up on what I said. Then he turned to me and he said, Mama, you are tired. You are tired today. I said, yes. He said, I feel that way sometimes. I said, really, when? He said, after I've played football, I'm thirsty, but I'm too tired to even get up and drink water. <laughs> Empathy. Empathy at its best. I've been told to stop. There are many slides, and we will leave the slides with the organizers. It's not possible that there's even five, there are even any five minutes anywhere that can be squeezed out of anywhere. Thank you. God bless you, sister. The power of shoes. And I don't mean buying shoes for those who love shoes. I mean shoes to step into and see the world through someone else's eyes. Umair and his, his bird, from a hadith that we know, the Prophet wasalam, was once told about a little boy whose bird had died. The boy's name was Umair. He was the younger brother of Anas bin Malik. And when the Prophet wasalam, heard about it, he actually went to the boy's house to try and cheer him up. A little bird, a little bird, a little boy. Sometimes you might see a child crying over something like that or a broken toy. You say, is that why he's crying so hard? I thought somebody died. The prophetic way is to empathize, step into the child's shoes, and that's how you teach them to step into yours. Or when they have dreams, I once read somewhere in a beautiful book that came at a time I needed it, raising emotionally intelligent children, that if you buy your child a gift, like a car, and the child says, oh, I wish this car were that other one. They said, don't slam the child for it. Don't tell the child off for it. Join them in dreaming about how you also wish you had got them the other one. But maybe, inshallah, when you have more money, then later, you can do the teaching that next time, first say, thank you, mom. Thank you, uncle. Thank you, dad. And tell them, who can you actually tell, I wish you had gotten me the other one? Maybe you can tell me, but not auntie, not grandma. Later on, you do the teaching. I learned this also, and it helped me in helping my child deal with fear of thunder, with loneliness when his half-brothers went away to visit their mom, to lie down on the bed with him and say, you are missing them, and he would say yes and be crying. And I'd say, I know, I'm missing them too. The house is quieter, isn't it? We'll talk for a bit. And any time I did that, he didn't come to our room later at night to say, may I sleep in your room tonight? Because I had spent time with him lying in his bed, standing in his shoes and sharing with him this feeling of we are lonely together. And for thunder, I would lie in bed with him and tell him, listen, do you know what thunder is? No, it's praising Allah. It's actually Allah that gives the command. And I would say, wait, 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 we'll hear it soon. And when it starts, I'll say that, subhanAllah. And he would think that's amusing. And so he started listening to thunder instead of being frightened by it. The power of your words, comment their actions, label the things they do, attach those labels to them. Say you actually spent time with that new kid in your class. That was so thoughtful. You are a thoughtful child. You are a kind child. We tend to unleash our words more when they've done something wrong. Instead, unleash your inner teacher. See every mistake your child makes as an opportunity to teach them how to grow, how to be better, how to apologize, how to 
do what you call restitution. You've done this wrong thing. Okay, how do you think you can fix it? What can you do differently? Build moral identity for them. Then the power of caring for yourself. I mustn't leave this one out. Learn to breathe. Deep breaths, take them in. Your child has just done that thing you've told him not to do for a hundred times. Don't speak, breathe. Let it out. The room is upside down again. Breathe. Let it out. Toilet unflushed. All stuff sprayed all over the place. Breathe. Then you can call the child. Come and fix this. Grandma me, I love this one. Again, I read a lot, so I get things from places. I modify them to suit me. Sometimes you need someone to hold you, right? To hug you, to rub your back and say you're a great parent. It's okay, you're just doing the best you can. To say, yes, yes, you know, you shouldn't have spanked him or yelled at him or called her that name. But you were having a rough day yourself. Calm down later, you'll apologize, you'll make it right. You need someone to do it for you. Sometimes you want your spouse to do it for you or a friend. Sometimes your spouse isn't available, a friend isn't available. So do it for yourself. So my modification is I have grandma me. I have this person in my head that's really me, but is a grandmother. And she's everything nice that I'm not. She's warm and she's nurturing and she's sweet. And when I'm having a bad day, she comes, she rubs my back, she rubs my head. She says, Salatu, it's okay. Salatu, it's okay. I've used her a few times and it actually works. <laughs> I've already talked about sleeping in progress sign. You can have your own variant of that. It could be a sign, it could be just something you tell them, that if you see I'm doing this, it means I just need time to breathe. And some days just pamper yourself, pamper yourself. We all have our own pampering language. For some people it means wear any old raggedy thing and just do nothing. For somebody else it means go and shop and don't say, do I need it, just buy it. For somebody else, a cup of tea. For someone else, to sit and watch the children play at a distance. Anything that makes you feel a bit like a princess or a prince. <laughs> prince, anything that makes you feel relaxed, happy. From time to time, do it. Don't say, I'm a parent, I don't do that anymore. No, do it. Hanging out with girls, girlfriends or guy friends, go out, hang out. Just something that when you've done it, it's easier to <sighs> MashaAllah. And if you ever ask yourself, am I doing anything right? Do I know what I'm doing? Say, I'm doing some things right, I'm doing some things wrong. Do I know what I'm doing? No, not everything, but inshallah, my kids will be fine. And these are two great du'as for our children. I love them. I say them as often as I can. And may Allah make our striving easy for us. For those of us who have children, whether children by birth, children by marriage, children by friendship, or because you are a teacher, you've got kids in your class or school, or as a health worker, you have children you care for, may Allah make your task easy for you. And may everything you give to them be witnesses for you on the day of judgment. And for those who don't have children of their own yet, may Allah give you children that will be the coolness of your eyes. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for the extra five, I think more like seven minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.